Okay, let's get started. Learning English through intelligent games. This talk is part of AI for Good series. And we will talk about uh, educational challenges in developing countries, especially with regards to learning English. Uh, we will talk about some of the machine learning algorithms which can be applied to uh, solve some of the interesting <laughs> challenges in ESL learning space. And finally, we will dive into pra uh, practical setup uh, of a system in Azure which can scale for production use. But first of all, let's talk about education. Most people will agree that education is one of the key factors in driving countries out of poverty. Only people can change economies. Only people can drive the change at the country level. And education helps to develop future leaders, future politicians, future business and social leaders. However, what many people don't know is there is a chronic teacher shortage in developing countries. UNESCO estimates the need of 70 million people, uh, 70 million teachers needed to be added to the workforce. That's 70% increase. That's a huge number, a really big problem. Uh, we've been working uh, as part of distance teaching and mobile learning nonprofit organization, which is volunteer driven, uh, to help and address that problem. I personally had the privilege of uh, going to Uganda, Venezuela, uh, Colombia. Uh, in Ethiopia and met amazing kids, uh, really dedicated teachers and the folks who are just super, super talented, but they just denied an opportunity to be successful. And for me, that's the key of social injustice. Talking to teachers uh, on our trips, uh, they really view e-learning as part of the solution. And from e-learning perspective, there are two key factors which are big blockers. One is obviously a connectivity. Uh, there is a big connectivity problems in sub-Saharan Africa, obviously in Latin America as well. But the second factor is the ability to uh, understand and process the information. And uh, that means knowing English, because uh, English is a top language in global information production. Most of half of internet content is in English. And uh, if you think about uh, kids in countries like Ethiopia or kids who speak uh, Kyrgyz, Tajik, for them, even if they have the best connectivity in the world, uh, but they don't know English, internet is pretty much closed. But it's even more when just access to the internet and uh, have, having the ability to uh, read web pages and uh, watch videos on the internet. It's about uh, communication. It's about uh, ability to get later good and high paying jobs. And that's something which really resonates to me. Uh, as you guys probably noticed, English is not my first language. And uh, I know firsthand how important English is uh, for kids who are growing up uh, and what opportunities it can open in the long run. Artificial intelligence can help, and that's what, where the, we, we saw the opportunity for us to apply our knowledge in AI space and in solving this problem. Talking to teachers, uh, they've been really methodical. Basically, learning any language, it's, you know, it means developing competencies in four areas. Reading, writing, speaking, and comprehension. And across, uh, there is one more area, which is vocabulary. Uh, and vocabulary is not just a simple list of words. Vocabulary is the ability for kids to recognize a written word, recognize spoken word, being uh, able to pronounce the word correctly, uh, and being able to write the word. So again, we thought, oh, great, this is really well-scoped area where we can apply some of the AI algorithms to help. And the way how we wanted to approach it is first, let's develop a dictionary uh, of the words we, we want to use in our e-learning for kids. And uh, there are many, many uh, dictionaries and vocabularies already available. The reason we wanted to develop our own was really simple. We wanted to uh, provide teachers with the capability to translate learnings in something fun and usable for kids. What we thought, would it be really cool if teacher can take a look on the statistics for his class or her class and say 80% of my class knows 80% uh, of words from Lion King. Let's watch Lion King together as a class. Or that particular student knows 90% of uh, Beauty and the Beast. 
let him or her watch that particular movie. In this way, kids can actually translate what we learned into something practical and usable for them. So we wanted to develop this dictionary. We wanted to featureize the words in, in the dictionary so we can use those words into some kind of recommendation system where we can recommend different uh, words for different groups of users. And finally, develop a user progress monitoring system where we can maybe potentially monitor the progress of the users and feed it back into the uh, you know, learning system and recommendation system. So uh, we started with corpus of 60 G-rated cartoons, movies, and books, basically kids' classics. Uh, run an LTK, uh, really straightforward NLTK uh, algorithms on top of that to extract term frequency, inverse document frequency, and parts of speech. Uh, it came back as a 25,000 unique words. Uh, we run obscene filtration. So you'll say G-rated movies, classics, obscene words, really you will be surprised how many obscene words we filtered out. Uh, then we filtered out uh, the named entities and non-English words, basically made up words which you know, really frequently uh, used in cartoons and, and movies. And finally, uh, we overlapped our dictionary with iWeb dictionary uh, to extract all words variations. So for example, if we saw a word running and that's the only uh, you know, word variation which we saw, we actually extracted the lemma run and then uh, overlap with iWeb dictionary to figure out all the possible uh, words variations. At this point, uh, we filtered our dictionary only to words which appeared at least in 10% of our corpus. And we said, this is our pristine, clean, great uh, dictionary which we can start using in uh, teaching kids. And uh, Vikas will tell more how we did it. So um, first, I'm going to show you a demo of like one of the games on the platform that students play. So this game is called uh, Words Battle. So, uh, so the first thing that, this, that a student does in this game is choose uh, the native language that the student's coming from. So uh, assuming I choose Spanish. So, the, so what, what a student has to do in this game basically is look at the word on top and try to, answer, try to link that word in, term, in, in their native language. So until As you get it right, the wizard hits the ogre, and you get points. And uh, if you get it wrong, then you lose a life. Bring. So students can keep playing this game Battle. on and on until they run out of lives, and at which point the, the game ends with a score for the student. So um, what you see here is like the leaderboard of students playing the game and their scores from like different countries. And uh, this is basically one of the, the multiple games on the platform that students play to help improve their vocabulary. So like the, so, um, so basically, the the way we initially recommended words was based on the TF-IDF index of the corpus that we had gathered before, and uh, using that, the the basic assumption was that more frequent words are the the first words that you probably want to learn in terms of importance, and that's how the words were given out to students in the game. As they keep playing the game, the words keep changing depending on that index. So um, by running this game and just taking a, a 
taking the logs, we collected logs based on, by setting up a telemetry pipeline. And uh, based on a one month flight for those logs, we collected data such as like the word, what students answered for that word, then uh, what game they were playing because there are like multiple games on the platform, the native language of the student, and, and the total score that the student has. And uh, just some uh, highlights of the statistics here are we had uh, 92,324 entries to the words asked in the game uh, in total with 44 user languages. And this is a one month flight, by the way. And Spanish was the most represented with 3,281 users and around 30,000 entries. And the graph that you see below is just the top 10 languages in, uh, sorted by the, the number of unique users. So it's the, the top four are Spanish, Vietnamese, Portuguese, and Turkish. Um, so now that we have collected all this data, we thought we could go like a step further and try to like improve the, the word recommendation and, and or at least try to alter it because it's obviously uh, the frequency of the words alone is probably not the best indicator for the difficulty of a word. The difficulty of a word is a subjective measure in some sort that a student gives for the word depending on uh, his or her strengths and weaknesses. And we need to capture that a little bit better. And in our hypothesis, one of the major strengths that a student has is already the native language of that student or where that student is coming from. So for example, uh, words such as princess is easier to learn for a student coming from uh, a Spanish background because the, the, the Spanish word is princesa. And they, they kind of do pattern matching by themselves by just looking at the word and it's easier to answer princess. <coughs> so what you can see here is, is a table uh, based on which we generated a new index uh, for, for word difficulty that we think that students perceive for each English word. And language plays a crucial component in that. So we use the historical success rate. That is, for every, like, for example, for the word princess, every single Spanish student got that word right. So it kind of tells us that this probably is a little bit of an easier word for them. And the edit distance, which is basically what students seem to do when they see a word, which is just pattern matching between what the word is in their native language to what the word is in English. And, uh, and the TFIDF score that we had already calculated before, and we just evened out the, the weightage for each of these different signals and re-indexed the word for a new ranking system. So I'm flighting, so now we fly them both at like 50% each which is the, the, the old ranking system and the new ranking system. And um, based on the, the metrics here, we had around 14,265 entries for the same number of users in both in the language ranking system and 13,380 in the, in the TF-IDF uh, system. And we found that 17% more students got answers right for words presented to them in the treatment. And that's something which we wanted because we wanted students to engage with the games more and keep playing them more, uh, again and again uh, and not get discouraged by difficult words, basically. And we also found 11% more sessions from unique users in the treatment. That is, people kept coming back to play the games, uh, even, even though the number of unique users was the same in both flights. So now uh, Ben will talk about the, the next steps that we are taking in this recommendation area. Thank you, Vikas. So one of the problems that we try to solve is to gauge the level of uh, mastery of the users as well as the level of difficulty of the words um, in order to provide them with the right study materials as well as to monitor the progress. Institutional uh, users also want to map their uh, progress to the standardized levels. For example, the uh, common European framework of references for languages, the CEFR, defines A1, A2, B1, B2, and C1, C2 levels. So one way to do this is to quantify the level um, using some heuristic rules. For example, uh, user level can be estimated based on their uh, vocabulary size. So for example, a user who mastered 500 words can be said to be in the class of A1 while a user who has mastered 10,000 words can be defined as the C2 level user. Um, a word level can be defined based on um, 
for example, the, uh, how frequently it appears in the materials. But this, this heuristic is not very sophisticated uh, when mapping to the standardized tests. Um, also, users at different ages and different uh, profession um, have different purposes, and thus prefer to be exposed to different sets of uh, words. Uh, for example, a kid's user who uh, learned English through uh, cartoons, watching cartoons, are exposed to a different distribution of words compared to an adult user who uh, wants to learn some basic conversational skills for business. Um, so different study material affects the uh, word popularity. And also, as mentioned before, different countries have different rates of study the word. Uh, since they can, you know, based on the similarity of the two languages. So uh, next step, we looked at our task from a different approach using the classic recommender engine to solve the problems. So in this framework, consider we have a set of n users u and a set of m words w. The study results from the games can be stored in a matrix R of size n by m, where R i j equals 1 means that user UI correctly answered the word WJ. The result is a very sparse binary matrix with many empty cells. We only consider true or false results for now, um, but in the future we might want to expand this to uh, real numbers because we can take into account um, other factors such as the time taken to answer a word can be an indicator of user's mastery of that word, etc. So using the non-negative matrix factorization technique, we can break up this matrix of user word into two smaller rank, low rank matrices, which represent the users uh, and, their, and their user latent attributes, as well as, as well as the words and their latent word attributes. These latent user and word attributes can be used to classify a word's level of difficulty and a user's level of mastery. In order to classify a user in the standardized uh, tests, we ask students of respective level classes to play the game. Uh, for, so for a new user, uh, for, for example, we collected uh, user A to be um, in the you know, English class A, and user Bob to be in, in class B, and Casey in the level C. So for a new user, David, whose level to be estimated, um, we asked David to play a couple of games um, his scores went through the system, and it seems that David is performing, was performing uh, at the closest level to user Casey, who is at level C. So it's our safest bet to say that David is right now at level C, and so we'd recommend words at that level to him. Uh, similarly, word level estimation can be estimated from the results of the users. So for example, the word uh, distinct um, is to be estimated. We can see from the latent attributes that the word distinct is most similar uh, to the word campaign, which is to be uh, likely studied by C-level students. So the word distinct is most likely to be in that uh, level. Next, I'm going to pass back to Alexi to talk about the engineering setup. Great. From the very beginning, uh, we were not sure how many kids would play the games, how many people will use the platform, but we wanted to design it for scale. And it's good what we did, because uh, the moment we start introducing AI and uh, some of the more advanced learning techniques, the usage of platform just skyrocketed. Uh, by now, about you know, half of a million students already play the games, which translates into 50,000 unique monthly users. Uh, you know, from 187 countries. Uh, so looking on engineering setup, obviously Azure is a you know, great platform for us to use. And from the very beginning, the idea for us was each learning module, each game should be independent unit which can emit some kind of events. And the way how it's done is basically each uh, learning module is written in HTML5 it communicates with the set of APIs by using uh, JavaScript SDK. Uh, and JavaScript SDK batches the events and send them um, to the server side via API call. And then those events actually getting posted onto service bus. Uh, and uh, 
we have a set of processors which monitor service bus topics and then pick up the events from service bus and dump them into something we call commit log. Uh, that's basically a huge table uh, denormalized uh, based on time series. It's basically just all the events one by one being written into that table. We also have a separate set of processors implemented as Azure functions, uh, which later go and pick up the uh, events from the commit log, aggregate the data, and push them into different tables. That uh, transformation of the data is really interesting on its own, because what's happening is part of the data is actually going and floating back into the games, into the dashboards presented to teachers, and so on, and part of the data is actually going back into the machine learning algorithms, uh, which can be used for offline retraining of our models. Um, there are a couple interesting things we want to do in future. First of all, we want to move to event grids, obviously. We want to scale it even more uh, on the you know, notifications and uh, event processing side. And another interesting part is right now, all our retraining of our models uh, is offline semi-manual. Basically, the data is being collected, it dumps into a specific format, and then someone needs to go run Python scripts, rerun the uh, model generation. Would be awesome to reuse uh, some of the modern techniques in Azure, such as Databricks, in order to automate that piece of the pipeline as well, so the learning is actually automatic. Uh, the part of the plan was to show you a video uh, of kids playing the game. Unfortunately, we were told there are some uh, security restrictions about downloading and playing videos. So that's the picture of one of our kids playing the platform. We, uh, we work, as I said, in multiple countries. Uh, most uh, uh, you know, uh, amounts of students are in uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Colombia. Most recently, Marie Kana School from Colombia signed up uh, to use this platform for 1,600 students as part of just normal, regular school process. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, visit dtml.org, and thanks a lot for your attention. We have a time for a few questions.